Perfect. Thank you. I got you. Lovely. Thank you, Google. Uh, See, so yeah, I keep forgetting and logging into the other one. But yeah, welcome everyone. Today is Thursday, April 28th for the community call here at SCURF. Uh, we're going to be talking a bit about open peer review, uh, presenting the process that we've kind of developed around it. Uh, and then we'll answer any kind of questions or thoughts that come up and really just want to have a discussion around some of both our specific process, but also, you know, using that as a springboard to discussing some elements of open peer review more broadly. Before I actually pass it off uh, to, to get a, an actual uh, presentation on the, the overview, uh, excuse me, on the open peer review process as it stands today, I just want to do some level setting overall. I guess now that the recording has started, uh, sorry, I'm not on video, having tech issues today. Um, hey, uh, yeah. Eugene, could I pause you for a quick second? It looks like there's uh, two Google meetings going on right now, and uh, half, the, half the group is in the other call. So I'm just going to try and post the link to this one yeah, and that one and, and try one. and... Yep, yes, yeah. please. I don't know how that happened. That must have been a result of me trying to copy the calendar invite and make sure that got sent. So I will track that better next time. Thank you, Umar. Thank you, Umar. No worries. Um, just going to try and get them over here so you don't have to repeat yourself. And Oh, yeah. Apologies for that, everyone. So let's just give it a moment while people funnel over here. Or maybe we're just exploring what this meeting can look like in parallel or simultaneously. <laughs> We're in a super position right now. Exactly. There we go. That's that's the fun spin on I messed up and made two conflicting invites. Um, yeah, my apologies for the confusion. Thank you all for, for jumping in and filing in here. Uh, we were just about to get started with some high-level context, uh, and then we'll actually jump in to get a presentation, uh, a quick run-through of the overall process as it stands now. So the, the general background of this is we want to, overall, we see open peer review as something that has been explored in academia and uh, meta research and, 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 you know, a number of domains uh, extensively for quite some years now. And so we are not pretending to come in and, you know, swoop in and solve any major standing problems. But we did want to uh, start looking at what peer review for independent researchers looks like. What is it providing a similar type of peer review that currently is only really uh, provided for folks going through formal publishing or applying to a conference, uh, an academic conference? What does it look like providing that kind of service as a public good just for anyone who has concrete research outputs that they want to have opened up? And so we started thinking about what could a minimum viable open peer review process look like? What is the minimum set of actions that need to take place to actually provide someone some structured feedback from some experts uh, so that with the goal of their research product improving? Uh, so that's really kind of the main uh, why are we doing this is we want to explore what does it look like supporting researchers who may be operating in an environment where they don't have a lot of structured support uh, beyond their direct social network. And how can we provide this kind of open peer review um, as a free service or as a public good uh, in order to add that kind of additional layer of feedback and uh, another mechanism for improving uh, research outputs? And the logic behind wanting to do this is because so much of the Web3 space has really been built by independent researchers uh, who just come up with ideas or primitives or code, and they just kind of implement it and see how it runs in, uh, out in the wild. So we want to try to think of, is there a way to be able to support those independent researchers in getting some more structured feedback? So as of right now, we are calling this kind of the, our open peer review experiment because we do want to see uh, what this looks like. Uh, and we recognize that we are at the very beginning of this journey and it's going to take a lot of experimentation and exploration to actually understand uh, where can we make any potential improvements uh, and how do we keep providing that kind of a benefit to independent researchers. So the other element that I'll, I'll add of what we're kind of making sure to focus on right from the get-go 
is actually incentivizing peer reviewers. And we realize uh, as we think of going forward from here, there's a whole landscape of decision variables that we want to map out so that we intelligently experiment with different components of open peer review. Uh, but one thing that we know we definitely want to include from the beginning is the premise that uh, if people are doing some kind of work, they should be recognized for that work and, and compensated for that. So uh, we've already had some discussions with folks who I know are much more knowledgeable about peer review and have been uh, much more around it and the design around it than we have. Uh, and there are questions of, you know, is financial compensation the right one or not? And, you know, that is something that we absolutely want to explore over time, but at least at the beginning until we can figure out, you know, any other forms of, of uh, compensation that seem uh, like a good incentive and maximizes engagement around this kind of review, uh, we do want to start with financially incentivizing uh, peer reviewers. So that's something that you'll also hear about in the process today. So yeah, I want to keep my bit as short as possible. So just to recap, that was the, you know, the, the things that we're starting with this baseline. And again, this very much is a baseline for experimentation is uh, we want to figure out the minimum viable process and we want to uh, start compensating reviewers. And this peer review goes to independent researchers who are not pushing for formal publication. So with that general context set, I will pass it off to uh, Umar and Nick to run us through the current state of how we're thinking about the process. Uh, thank you, Eugene, for the intro. Um, so as part of this minimum viable process idea, I guess I'll just add that uh, we're very much presenting just sort of an initial draft for a project right now. And we're really hoping to have an interactive session where we get lots of feedback that helps us improve the draft, helps us improve sort of the process of the experiment that we're running around open peer review and make it the best it can be. As part of that, we're really interested in knowing what people like and especially interested in knowing what people don't like. Uh, because if you like it, we don't have to change it. But if you don't like it, we should definitely consider changing it. Uh, so uh, please jump in, uh, ask questions, give, give us your comments, give us your feedback. Uh, that's really what this call is all about. Um, and I guess without further ado, I'll just start running through some of the uh, parts of the project. Uh, so Eugene already covered a lot of why we're doing this, increasing the avenues to feedback for independent researchers who don't already have um, an option for peer review because maybe they don't have the social support. Uh, exploring the effects of financially incentivizing peer review. One of the great things about crypto is that we're all about financial incentives and in other places where that might be frowned upon for peer review uh, here in Web3, uh, it is sort of uh, part of the fabric of what we do. And then lastly, um we really want to collect and share data from the process what we learn from uh having feedback available for independent researchers and what we learn from financially incentivizing peer review we want to share that data so that other people are able to draw the conclusions on it and especially um we're hoping that you know what we end up presenting here today is just the first round of an experiment that may continue into many more rounds and that by collecting data with each round, we'll be able to track how, as we adjust variables and parameters in this experiment, uh, the results change. And the most um, experimental part of this is likely the financial incentives and how we change the mechanisms around that, collect the data around what impacts that has and really continue to track it over time. Uh, and share it with the community so that everyone's able to draw their own conclusions. Um, and in sort of uh, drawing up our experimental process, we started with principles. We started with asking ourselves, what is peer review good for? What is the primary purpose of it? And it's pretty much widely, widely agreed uh, that there are two main purposes, uh, that it's a filter for journals, uh, so that when somebody submits a paper to a journal, and the journal considers publishing it, it goes through this peer review process. And if it's not up to snuff, if it's not of high enough quality, it does not get published. And journals have to do this in part because they were print-based, that they have a limited number of pages and they wanna make sure they can only, they only publish the highest quality content. Uh, so peer review serves this filtration mechanism to make sure only the highest quality science that's really accurate and reliable uh, gets shared with the broader scientific community. 
Um, the second purpose of peer review really is this feedback mechanism for scientists to improve their research, um, for them to get um, comments from their peers who are also experts in the field about what they're doing right, what they're not doing right, so that they can make it better and better and better. And knowing these two purposes of peer review, um, we asked ourselves, what do we believe and what are we doing with this experiment? So the first sort of thing we decided on is that we're not a publisher and we're not trying to be a publisher. And because of that, we don't need to be someone who's filtering. We don't need to be someone who's saying uh, this should get published or doesn't get published. We don't have some limited amount of pages that we can print on. Instead, we have, you know, the internet. We have databases and we don't necessarily need to uh, limit the amount of information. Um, and, and we believe that in a free and open internet, that kind of limitation, that kind of gatekeeping can easily, dangerously extend into censorship. And that science, which might be against the grain today in 50 years or 100 years, could be very much mainstream. So, so keeping something out just because it's unpopular, um, just because peers in the field, uh, it disagrees with their research, is not something we want to do, even if it comes at the expense of letting some low quality science in. With that said, there still needs to be some way of telling what's high quality science and what's low quality science. And we believe that that quality can be weighed along a gradient that the peer review process journals use today is a simple accept or reject, which can hide a lot of nuance. Um, not all papers that get accepted are equal. Not all papers that get rejected are equal. Instead, they exist naturally a longer gradient and that accept or reject process sort of oversimplifies the quality of the papers. What we really are interested in exploring is how we can keep the granularity of the quality of a paper without accepting or rejecting because we do not need to accept or reject since we're not a publisher. So we're really interested in seeing, can we assign the quality of a paper on a sliding scale? Instead of filtering papers, can we sort them um, and, and still distinguish between low and high quality science without gatekeeping? And then in addition to the two purposes of peer review on the last slide of, of filtering and feedback, sort of now we're saying we don't want to filter, but we really want to focus on feedback. And there's, there's another purpose that we think peer review can serve, which is really being of use to the reader of a paper to help them assess the likelihood of truth, credibility, scientific quality of a paper. Uh, just like we go on Amazon and we read product reviews, or we go on Yelp and we read hotel reviews, or Rotten Tomatoes for movie reviews um, to help us determine if that product or movie or hotel is, is good. We think of reviews that are open can help the reader determine if a paper um, is reliable. Uh, and that this will be especially useful to readers who do not belong to the subject area uh, that the author of a paper does or the reviewers of the papers do, um, but still allow them to sort of draw the highest um, quality takeaway from the paper. And that this is a bit of a shift from reviews which are only for the author to improve their paper or, or for the editor to determine if a paper needs to be accepted or rejected. Rather, the reviews sort of have a different context, which is they, they would be for the reader um, as well as the author and, and serve that dual purpose. And then, and then finally, um, we believe in incentives that motivate people. They can be both, they can be financial, social, intellectual, and we're interested really in exploring how those different incentives that play into the peer review process um, can be adjusted for maximum effect. And so, so these are sort of the principles we started with that we don't want to filter. We do want to be a feedback mechanism. We do want to weigh the quality along a gradient. We do want to help the reader of a paper and we want to incentivize peer review so that more of it happens at a higher quality. Um, and, and those are sort of the general principles we, we have sort of going into this process. Uh, I'd be super interested to know how that jives with what people, in the, uh, what people on the call today are thinking. Um, if this is 
more or less um, in agreement or if there are big points that people disagree on. I have a question. So Please. I'm I've been in the Web3 space for a while and I, th I think what's really important there is kind of the question of incentives and how they work in the relation of can it be gamed, can it be borderline hacked, right? So when you talk about incentives, I mean, financial incentives are clear, as in I give you something of monetary value, you do X, Y, Z, right? But then when we talk about social incentives or intellectual incentives, what do you imagine them to be as in, for example, a social incentives as in I give you status if you do X, Y, Z or intellectual as in I, I call you smart. So you do X, Y, Z. Um, yeah, these, these are much harder incentives to, I, I think, measure than the financial ones. We're, we're, we're not honestly yeah, sure. Just, um, oh, Eugene, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. And Umar, we're just getting a little bit of feedback on your side. So if you don't mind, just please mute while you're not uh, presenting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, because uh, uh, I see also a couple of people have their hand raised. So I just want to respect that. But uh, just really quickly, I'll just say that. So exactly what you're alluding to is part of the landscape of experimentation. We want to start thinking through beyond this current uh, initial round. The goal of this initial process, which we'll get into um shortly uh or, or after this first round of questions will be all about presenting this kind of baseline process and concurrently while we're running through this first iteration of uh, open peer review based on the baseline process we are going to bring together all of the known research that has shown about you know how does uh providing other forms of incentive actually work in helping or hurting peer review and make sure that we're kind of reviewing all of the existing research on that side to intentionally start experimenting with different versions of you know social or reputational or other kinds of systems because uh, we, we think that there's a lot to be played with there, but we want to make sure that it's done in a way where we can actually have a sense of the impact of different variable changes that we make. Uh, so I'll stop my piece there. I saw Rich had his hand up and then I think it was Rich, Chris and Paul. Thanks, Eugene. I want to follow on a bit. You, you sort of, uh, anticipated what I wanted to say as well. So I want to reinforce the fact that this is an experiment, um, but to speak to the, the notion of gamification. Um, this is my own personal view, but my, my personal view is that the system as it exists in the traditional world is gamified right now, um, and it's weighted to a small number of individuals that are uh, being rewarded with that. And it's my own personal belief that uh, anytime you create a, a system that has reputational or financial uh, incentives baked into it, gamification becomes uh, an issue. Uh, the open part of open peer review is where I find the most compelling uh, experiments to be had here, where um, the gamification is happening behind closed doors with gatekeepers at this point. Uh, if we open those doors and we allow some sunlight in and the people that are doing the reviews are, the reviews are public or the work that they've done is public, historically public, the compensation mechanisms are public, then that allows the community or the ecosystem or some social and uh, uh, professional norms to be established uh, and that's where the experiment begins to iterate so um it, i think that one of the challenges with the peer review process right now is there's this notion that it's a very um it's almost like a sacred process it's being done for the good of academe um i'm not entirely sure whether that's actually the case or not and i think that we'll find out by um exposing or uh, creating mechanisms that are publicly uh, auditable and historical records of the activities that went on in these peer reviews. And uh, if there's you know, some of the more negative aspects of human nature, like collusion or um, uh, silencing of, of uh, competition, et cetera, all these other things that potentially could be going wrong in the, open peer, in the peer review process, um, if there's an audit trail, and there's a public marketplace and there's a community and there's a forum where these things are all being discussed. Uh, it's my hope that that would mitigate the, the gaming over time as the processes are iterated upon. Right, thanks, that's it for me. Chris, did you want to jump in? Hey, can you hear me? 
Yes. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with the open aspect of peer reviews. Um, I would say there's so two things on my side. One of the things is there's a rich literature that should be uh, synthesized and, and dug into about uh, prior experimentation regarding the peer review process. There's a rich literature in computer science. There is a computer literature on peer predictions around accepting computer science paper and conferences, the problems of uh, uh, collusion rings as well, emerging in these systems. So all of the uh, negative effects and basically gamification that Rich has alluded to, there's, um, there's actually fertile research on uh, attempts to a mechanism designed to mitigate some of these risks. So that's one I think I would really encourage you to um, to really uh, make a good synthesis of the state of the art there, and especially go through to computer science literature. Um, another point I think is that I think it's, it's very useful to, to, to take a, a microeconomic theory grounding when we're studying mechanism design. And uh, in the context of peer review, there's basically a model that I think is, um, is a good model to think about peer review, the model is as follows. Uh, peer review is basically an agent-based uh, uh, system that in which you have uh, agents that are acting as uh, predictive algorithms themselves. So reviewers are essentially taking in a dense input and formulating a judgment at the end of it. And the editor is acting like an ensemble aggregator who's taking the outputs from these uh, classification devices and uh, aggregating uh, these judgments into his own judgment. And uh, there's basically three conditions for quality purity to be done. The first one is competence. The second one, so the person has to be truthful about the, his level of competence. And I think you'll have experiments like the open peer review experiment in, in, in computer science where uh, they're basically taking the Asian approach and we're giving a gradient about how confident I am that I'm qualified to peer review this paper. I think that's a very interesting point, right? The idea to, to have bounds of confidence about your ability to judge a paper. Uh, another point is that uh, peer review requires truthfulness, right? So that there's a failure mode, which is gatekeeping. So you could, you could be, okay, this is my, my land, this is my journal, this is my field, I'm not going to let you go through, I'll just, you know, move you down because I'm considering that your work is not novel enough or whatever other methodological nitpicking I go out against you, right? So there's another, which is a failure mode, which is just uh, people, these people that are being peer reviewed as well and doing your work are your competitors for funding. It's very important to keep in mind that they are your competitors. And so there is gatekeeping behavior that emerges in peer review and it's a failure mode. So telling the truth is essential. And finally, exerting effort, right? You could have someone who's telling the truth, who's also correctly reporting on his level of competence, but unfortunately not exerting the required effort for that person to give a constructive, uh, high-quality feedback in the peer review process, right? So just to make that you know, short, a useful, uh, a useful and interesting framework to, to study and understand peer review is, is, is taking this agent-based approach and having the, the, the whole economic quality inside to understand what are what is the what are the type of incentive structures that should be put in place such that the agents will choose as their dominant strategies the one that satisfies right these different requirements and produces high quality predictions. So hopefully that's some food for thought to uh, to, to foster some curiosity and some interesting experiments down the road for you guys. Yeah. Thank you. For that's super interesting. Yeah, thank you for sharing yeah. that. Uh, super excited to dig into that literature and those model-based, um, uh, those those agent-based models. Uh, thank you for sharing. Just please say that uh, before handing it off to, to Paul, uh, that um, one of the things we want to think about as we go beyond this baseline process is establishing uh some kind of uh you know on our github or, or between the github and the forum uh to kind of have a some of the literature outline that we're pulling this from and that we're exploring and to both look at the the meta research that's already available but also look at other relevant domains that that can be pulled in and that's going to be an area that in general we're trying to think of how to uh you know create bounties for some of our notable works list and things like this so uh, if that's something that gets you excited, uh, please let us know. I'm definitely happy to chat about uh, how to uh, get kind of th those kinds of uh, lists publicly available for everyone in the ecosystem. Um, but yeah, uh, Paul, did you or uh, Rich? I see you hopped off me. Do you want to say something before I pass it off to Paul? Well, yeah, I just wanted to point out that um, uh, there it seems like we have a lot of slides to go through, so I don't want to get too bogged down in the weeds right now. There's going to be a this is not the only time where we're going to talk about open peer review. This is uh, 
we're, we're taking this very seriously it's group and we're going to be talking a lot about these things there'll be more calls uh so keep that in mind um i i hope i'm not stealing your thunder umar but this is an open and collaborative process as we do open peer review and so there's going to be opportunities for people that are interested in the things we're talking about to get engaged with us and so please keep that in mind as you're watching these slides that we we want to bring as many community actors into the, the fold as possible while we're performing these experiments so christopher keep that in mind as well but umar i'll, I'll put that back to you yep thank you um want to get lots of people involved um this is i guess the the whole uh advantage of a community uh paul did you want to jump in uh yeah i mean but if, if you have more to cover i would love to see what you have to cover beforehand um i, I think one of the things i was just going to jump in on though is like as a person who has been part of peer review uh, processes before as a reviewer um in a world where there are not infinite resources uh in this idea that um quality can be weighted a lot of time and energy is going to be potentially spent on the lower quality end as opposed to the higher quality end. Like just like moderating a community, like moderation in general, like the low energy or the, the low quality stuff often gets the most time and attention. And um, any type of mechanism that can protect resources, right? So I, I recognize the pushback on gatekeeping, but protecting resources so that it's not all spent down in the weeds like I, I have some friends who are physicists right um, the amount of time that they have to field the question where the premise of e equals mc cubed is like the correct assumed premise and like why can't you just answer this question right they get badgered by um incorrect questions right and so that's where that time and energy goes so any mechanism that can kind of have some protective feature i think would be interesting in this experiment Uh, that's really valuable to know that lots of times their time gets sucked up with low quality feedback and we need a, a mechanism to avoid that. I think one thing we're interested in exploring, and I'm just going to make this quick note and then pass it over to Nick to continue with the slides, uh, is uh, the uh, effect of AI and how that can be used maybe to save some researchers time. Um, I know we have Professor Shaw on from Carnegie Mellon, who's both a researcher in peer review and machine learning. Um, and there are some really interesting mechanisms being used at some machine learning conferences to save reviewers time on things like um, matching reviewers, but also on like things like doing standard uh, checks of the quality of a paper, just in terms of like, does it meet formatting requirements? Does it meet ethical standards? Um, and I'm hopeful that as the technology continues to improve, maybe it can do even more. Um, so we've, we've sort of grounded ourselves in the philosophy and principles uh, that we're aiming to achieve and now we need to sort of dig into the weeds and the details with the process so i'm going to pass that over to nick uh, to continue and also hopefully have more time um, for um, interaction and participation thanks umar um i saw photos you put your hand up do you have a quick question you want to make now um yeah, although it may start a full on, <laughs> full blown conversation, uh, it, it, but it has to do with uh, the gradable approach to quality and whether you're thinking of implementing a score, like for example, like a simple way would be a star system, or uh, where okay, I give this uh, if a 3.5 stars with a sort of justification, mm -hmm. or whether it will be in terms of some. Um, dimensions where you can have some sort of trade-off. So you don't have a unified sort of uh, way of ranking. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, we'll get into that a little bit later in the slides. Umar has some slides dedicated to that. But yeah, we're th having a number ranking that's associated with um, specific features of the paper. And each number ranking has like um, text associated with it to define what that number ranking actually means. Um, but yeah, we'll get more into this later in the presentation. Um, yeah, so Umar kind of set the philosophy for what we think peer review should be. Um, now I'll get into a little bit more details about what the specific first implementation will be. And again, this is the first implementation. We plan to do many different experiments 
where we're tweaking different variables. So this is just our first go at it. So of course, to do the peer review process, we need to have researchers who have research ready to be reviewed, and we need to have reviewers to actually review the papers. So right now, we're just going to be starting with people in our own network who are doing Web3 research. So this could be things like cryptography or governance or cybersecurity. Um, and then we will hand match the reviewers with the researchers. So we'll let the reviewers pick their top favorite papers so that they're more incentivized to read the paper and do a quality job. Also a note here is that the author's identities will be known to the reviewer at this point. The rationale for that is we will be able to allow the reviewers to self-identify if they have conflicts of interest with the author. Uh, this does bring up some potential biases that could be at play. In general, there's a bias where if the review of the paper is reviewing an author who's more senior than them, they might be nervous to give um, exact feedback where they would fear that the superior person in their field might look down at them or talk negatively about them if the reviewer gives a bad review. We're not too concerned about this in our experiment to start because we think that in Web3, there's an ethos of collaboration and helping and honesty. And also, we, the authors in our scenario would be independent researchers who are new to the field, don't have a large network. Um, so we believe that the reviewer will feel comfortable helping them. Um, but yeah, being aware of this bias is helpful so that when we're structuring the review, we can um, add in text to guide the reviewer to um, know that they should be comfortable giving honest and candid feedback. Um, and Faith, I see you put in the messages, essentially unpublished papers. Yes, this would be unpublished papers. So we would allow the independent researchers to get feedback on their papers. And then in from, and the goal being that we want to improve the quality of their paper. From there, they could take it to a journal and publish it, or they could post it as their white paper for a project that they're working on. Um, yeah, it's up to the researcher what they want to do with the paper after the fact. Pause there if anyone has any comments they want to bring up. Also, the hand raise feature works well for that. Um, yeah, so once the reviewers and researchers are matched, then we will ask the authors to post on the SCRF forum. So we're choosing the SCRF forum to start because it has a lot of the features that we need. You can highlight text, and the reviewer can respond directly to a portion of text. Uh, the forum is also completely open to the public, so the paper and the reviews will all be available to the community. We are thinking of other platforms to use for the review in the future, such as openreview.net, Hypothesis, or Blocksburg Peer Review. If there are other tools that you think we should look into, yeah, we'd appreciate if you can um, message in the chat so that we can look into that further. Because yeah, there are a lot of features that we'd want in addition to what we have in the SCRF forum. So we're still looking for the best tool for that. Um, then Mark, or well, Christopher, you can go ahead and chat first. Hey, uh, yeah, on that comment, I would love if you have a feature requirement list. I think that would be mm -hmm. very valuable. So if you come up with a feature feature wish list, because you know we're also we're building that type of infrastructure. And for us, I mean, if we can support you guys in any way possible during this, these experiments, uh, because we're focused on building infra, uh, we would love to know what's your ideal peer review tool and how it converges with our vision of what this ideal tool could be. So. I would love if we could continue that discussion with you as a future. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. We're putting together a list at the moment, and I'm sure we'll be adding to it as we run through some of the experiments. So we'll definitely be sharing that with you in the future. 
So yeah, once we've asked, yeah, so once we've asked the um, author to post their research on um, the SCRF forum, now we'll have the invited peer reviewers to leave feedback on the paper. So this can be feedback in the form of comments or in the form of ratings, which we'll get into later, which could eventually lead to a metric or a measurement to weight the paper. Uh, we just wanna, um, we're setting two week time span for the, or the invited reviewers to leave their feedback so that the independent researcher can get their responses back quickly. Uh, we'll also be allowing anyone in the community to leave a review. So since SCURF forum is publicly open, anyone can comment on the paper and leave their own reviews. So right now we won't be incentivizing the community reviews financially, but that is something we'd wanna experiment with in the future, potentially by having an open bounty for the community reviewers so that the best community reviewer can um, earn some financial incentives for their work as well. And yeah, we will, after the review has been put out there, then we will ask the authors to rate the review. Uh, this will help us to give at least some data on the quality of reviews so that when we're doing this experimentation, we can have a sense of what we're tweaking leads to better, or if what we're tweaking leads to better reviews or worse reviews. So we know that asking the authors is not the best method to go because the authors will be biased. Uh, for instance, if someone leaves a great review, then the author is gonna be happy when rating the reviewer. Um, conversely, if the reviewer leaves a negative review, the author might be upset and rate the review poorly. So yeah, this is kind of a question for the community. Are there other methods to rate the quality of review that we should look into? Um, there's a thought of using AI to do that, but it seems to, to be a bit far off at the moment. Um, also community review, so getting a crowdsourced opinion on what the review should be. Um, that could also potentially be gamified. So yeah, this is something that we'll definitely be experimenting with, but yeah, I would love to get some feedback. So I think Christopher, you had your hand up first. Yeah, so I mean, I love the questions you guys are asking. And I'm thinking a lot about these things. One of the, so, you know, there's a good old Chesterton Spence slide, which is how has it been done historically? Well, historically, there's an editor, right, who is intermediating between the reviewers and the authors. And the role of the editor is basically to form his own judgment of the reviews that he receives and assign his own level of credibility to each, right? So that's historically been the role of the editor. Um, and it's interesting, you know, what happens when you remove the editor out of the equation? If you also you even look at, you know, computer science conferences, you have chairs that evaluate these things. Uh, in traditional journals, you have very often an editor. Uh, and uh, there's a good reason for having an editor. It's a difficult job, but there's a good reason for it. Another way to do it without an editor, and I think here we're entering some very experimental territory, but there's a subfield uh, which is about eliciting truth and effort in, uh, in CS, and it's called uh, peer prediction. And the idea is that uh, if you have a set of peers, uh, you can look at the correlation between judgments of peers and basically assume that uh, the convergent, converging judgments are more likely to be correct than the divergent judgment. And you can create incentive structures and systems around that. Although I do caution in the context of science where the truth isn't clear cut and there is a sub substantial subjective component. And in this case, it's tricky. I mean, more generally, I would push back a little bit on the idea of rating papers you know, on a scale from one to 10. I think uh, that's, a, that's a risky thing. First of all, um, there's a substantial uncertainty Right, so as a rater, me as a peer reviewer, I'd be very uncomfortable rating a paper from one to 10. I'm comfortable because I know it reflects my own subjective biases. I'm comfortable because if the paper's bad, I don't wanna make the authors feel bad, right? So I have a social desirability bias. So what you risk of ending here is everyone being nice and that having very low quality signal to noise ratio, right? Uh, so I'd be, I'd be careful about that. And I think, you know, if you look at the history of like, we have this incredibly inefficient system where it gets rejected from journal A, go to journal B, 
And basically, at the end, you get a continuous measure, which is the plotting of impact factor along this line, essentially, right? And a way to look at this to like understand how this came about is just because this pre trading uh, from one shot evaluation process creates all sorts of this uncomfortable situations, right? So um, I would like, um, um, you know, I would enjoy you to think about what's the type of uh, metric or rating you want to give. And there's another interesting part, I think, which should definitely be uh, featured in the type of experiments you're running is the idea that we can have feedback oriented peer review and curation oriented peer review, right? The feedback oriented or oriented peer review is about, hey, can you make my paper better? That's your job as a peer review, right? Make a paper, paper better. And that's so useful, right? And then there's curation oriented peer review. This is like, where within the hierarchy of knowledge does this fit, given my model of how likely the impact of this work will grow over time, right? These are two orthogonal questions, right? And right now they're bundled together in the peer review process. And I think there's fruitful experimentation in unbundling these two functions. Yeah, that's a really interesting way to separate the two. Um, we'll definitely be thinking about that more and how the, how the curation-oriented peer review fits into our um, set. And I think, yeah, the peer prediction and the, the editor is a good thing to trial out as well to rate the quality of reviews. Can I jump in really quick and ask Christopher a question? I know that this is kind of outside the model, but I I'm curious why you think to separating those two would be more useful than having them bundled together, Christopher? Um, so these, these are bundled together. And when you have, so I've had, I've had, you know, in my empirical experience having papers peer reviewed, I've had uh, reviewers that are strictly on the on the gatekeeping level, right? They're telling me why my paper is not novel enough to get gather enough citations in the future to be impactful enough, essentially, right? So they're they're basically that's the role of the editor, ideally, that's supposed to be doing that prediction, right? But that person is providing that information. I've also had extremely extraordinarily useful editors who say, hey, here's how you could improve that paper. It's good, but it could be better. And here are the ways to do it, right? So these two independent reviewers are responding to ambiguity of the task, right? Which is how should I conduct my peer review? And uh, that task ambiguity allows people to basically weasel their way into one or the other function. And I think, so I think, you know, if you unbundle them, then you can have task clarity and having the ability to get feedback on your work is also typically the kind of stage one you want to have, right? So if I have my way of getting my work reviewed, First thing I do is I do an open call for feedback. All right? I'll get great people to give me great ideas on how I can make my work better. And in the second phase, once, once I've consolidated my work with this great feedback, I would then take it out in the public and say, okay, guys, have at it, right? Chew it, you know, and like curate it. Tell me, tell me if this is good, right? And those are those are, you know, in, in, in my process of starting this, I would very much appreciate if these two processes were unbundled in some way. Okay, I see. Thanks for that. That's the ambiguity I, that I was caught up on. That makes sense to me. Hey, Theodore, I think you're next in line for raising a hand. Yeah, just just quickly. So when you mentioned, you know, rewarding like the most, like the best reviewer, um, I mean, oftentimes the question is, okay, you have the best reviewer with the best feedback. But what about the second best and the third best and the fourth best? If you take them together, are they not even sometimes more valuable like than the best reviewer? So for me, the question, if you get to the point to it, is like, how do you count to for the fuzziness of feedback, especially in you know the scientific space where there's so many different nuanced opinions? How can we quantify that in a meaningful way without creating a system that is essentially easy to game and only rewards the winner and everybody else is like, okay, sorry, you get nothing, even though you contributed a lot. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I do think that everyone can win at this game. Like two people could have excellent reviews. Um, they could be weighted the same. But yeah, there's definitely going to be some fuzziness with actually the score that we come up with, if it ends up actually being a score. Um, so yeah, that'd be important to keep in mind, like maybe there's some kind of confidence interval or warning, or maybe we stay away from a score like this entirely. 
we're going to come up against time, so I just want to make sure that we're going yeah. to get a chance to look at some of the implementation that might answer some of these ethical questions. Yeah, right I was just thinking of Mark. Could you go to the next slide? Could be done here. Um, yeah, this starts to get into the financial incentives. So one question that we're grappling with is like, how much do we want to pay people? What's peer review worth? So if any of you have opinions, I'd love if you put it in the chat. Um, how much would you pay for someone to review a paper for you? Um, or how much would you like to be paid to actually do a review? Um, yeah, we just like this is a one time. It maybe takes you six hours to do the peer review or take someone else to do six hours to do the review. How much would you like to be paid or would you be willing to pay? Uh, that'll just help us get a kind of sense of if we're in a ballpark range of what we're thinking. Um, yeah, so if you could put it in the chat, that would be great. Also, Chris, feel free to jump in. Yeah, so I mean, this is the heart of the question, right? The tone is the whole problem. How to set the incentive, right? And I think um, I would be, I would caution very much so uh, with paying peer reviewers. So there's a thing as a scientist, if you tell me, hey, I'll, do, I'll give you $100 if you peer review my work, I'm just not going to do it. My time is worth more than hundred dollars, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's the thing. So all of a sudden, you've introduced a monetary norm into some a service that I would naturally do for free for the benefit of science. Mm -hmm. So that's a risky thing to do. The second thing well, is risk, oh, risk sorry. adversarial selection, right? So you risk that the people that are most qualified to review the work actually will not see that this is worth their time. Right. Mm -hmm. Of course, all of this has, there's, of course, a certain uh, amount of money after which these problems disappear, but the question is whether the system is scalable at this, at this level, mm -hmm. right? So yes. I'm caution. I'd also point out to a movement, which is called like the $400 movement, which has had made a sort of mark, right, which is the idea, well, okay, I'll do high quality peer review, but it's going to be $400, right? And that seems to be a, a level that many scientists feel are comfortable with. I will, you know, high, you know, high quality peer review takes about six hours, six and a half hours, you know, on, on average, according to the data I've read on that. Um, annually, it's $2.5 billion that, of unpaid labor, essentially, if you, if you take the going rates for uh, peer reviewers and journals, you know, they explore that and they sell this for money, which is the, the you know, adding insult to injury. Uh, so yeah, so I think this is a very important uh, topic. The way we've been thinking about it, uh, that we're currently in our thinking, is that we don't want to treat scientists by giving them a piecemeal reward for conducting peer review. What we would, what we are more interested to do, is work on the side of social preferences. Right? Social preference is like doing good in the world, right? Because it comes from an intention of doing good in the world to create scientific work. So how about how can we? How can we take that initial impulse, that pro-social altruistic impulse, and magnify it with an incentive system so that you feel that the good that you're doing to the world is amplified, is leveraged up, right? Because that would tap into that intrinsic motive, which would prevent problems of adversarial selection and problems of economic sustainability down, down the line, right? Um, so one of the models, you know, we've been considering is something like fellowship. Right, so how about you're a big shot professor, you're one of the only person in the world that can understand this work on like set theory or I don't know what, and you're going through it and you're just doing this because you know that by, by doing this public good, you are generating a public good in the background, which is that other students, early career researchers who are being exploited by university are actually earning a small stipend, right? Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden I've created leverage on my pro-social motivation and I, I basically, I was able to like ward off the problems of adversarial selection because now I'm selecting for people who are altruistic and who, are, who want to do good, right? In that scenario, they still get paid as part of the fellowship? So in that scenario, when I'm doing a peer reviewer, I get, you know, there's, there's some sort of financial transfer to my organization, right? So we call these things, mm -hmm. you know, autonomous research communities, uh, SCURP, you know, is an autonomous research community. And um, the idea is that you take that input, right, that the value of that validation grant, for example, it goes into a pot, which is a treasury that's held by DAO. And that treasury is then used to dispense stipends to early career researchers, right? So now I'm a big shot. You know, I have a lot of experience. I'm the only per one of the only persons on earth that can understand this work and get quality feedback. By doing that, out of my altruistic motivation, 
I create a public good for people I care about, early career researchers that are getting spoiled, right? That's how you create yeah. the leverage in a behaviorally calm way, right? Yeah, it's a super interesting model. Um, yeah, Mara, do you want to maybe go to the next slide? Because yeah, we start to talk about some of the risks for financially rewarding peer review. It's like you mentioned some of, like in the second bullet point, um, people might not actually participate in the peer review because the money is just not worth it for them. And that is definitely a risk we're concerned about. So kind of the point of this slide is, are there other risks that we should be aware of that you all think exist that just because if we're aware of them, then maybe we can do some things to actually measure if they're occurring and do some preventative measures to try to avoid these risks at all. Um, so yeah, the two risks that we thought of are made like the one that Chris mentioned, that people who with enough money won't actually do the review. And we also worry that the quality of the review could diminish because um, the reviewers just might do the bare minimum just to get paid. So yeah, just in sake of time, I'll maybe ask you all to write that in the chat. Um, so I wanna let Umar get to some of his slides. And this next, and Umar, do you wanna maybe jump to the next slide? Um, we talked about different financial incentives as well. Um, we mentioned a fellowship, but not in the sense that you mentioned, Christopher, with where it goes to a DAO. We were just talking about the money would potentially go to each individual, and they're part of our collective, and they each get a stipend. But I think that um, voting on giving the money to early career um, researchers makes a lot of sense. Um, we also thought providing of the option, right? So provide the option, right? So if you need the money, you can take the money. But if you want to put it in a pool for early career researchers, you can do it too. You want to, you really want to tap into the to the pro social models here that scientists have, right? Even if there's you know, matters of reputation accrual and all of that and gatekeeping that play into it, I think you know if you can also create a system that self selects for good people by creating incentives that tend to self-select for good people, then you have a, a you know, potential recipe for a very highly productive and quality community as well. Yeah, and you can incentivize people to not necessarily take out of the pool um, because like that pool could be accruing interest and be going used to other meaningful causes. Um, cool. Um, if anyone else has any comments about the financial incentives or different models, Feel free to speak or, um, yeah, Chris, you can go ahead and then I'll pass yeah. it to Mar after this. So I, I have the same mindset as Chris in the sense of um, when academics are doing peer review, a lot of them will do it for free and then offering them money. There's like a point where it's an insult if it's not enough and they would rather do it for free. But I think there are like, as I said in the chat, there are different motivations. So having these different types of incentive structures, I think will help mitigate, like somebody can opt into the payment system and they don't have, have to take it. Like just assuming that they want the payment is one thing, but then giving people the option to take it or like, it doesn't have to go to a DAO, but having something that is measuring their output and then tracking it. Um, I think this is how we start to shift the culture because people deserve to get paid, but academia has shifted towards an exploitative model where it's like bottom line, uh, line item budgets. So people are then culturally bullied into working for free. So I think this is how we start to shift the culture from the ground up. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, the, the, the culture is such a big part of what we have to, change um you know we we talk a lot about like technology solutions um for for peer review uh but but a lot of the problems in science are these like cultural problems um where scientists are like expected to work for free and i think you know like where where we're struggling to figure out what the right amount to pay for review is um and i think that's something that we'll probably just have to play with different amounts that's not something we'll be able to answer right away but one of the really big questions that I think the slide is trying to get to is like, what is the right mechanism to determine who gets paid um, and how do we pay them? 
so should it just be if you submit a review, you get paid? Should it be if you submit a review and your review is determined to be one of the best by whatever whatever metric that is, you get paid? Or should it be that like you participate in a circle of reviewers and each reviewer looks at other reviews and allocates some amount of points to it that then splits some pool of funding? Um, and, and these are, I think, are like the biggest questions right now um, that we're trying to to figure out as we try to financially incentivize peer review. The simplest one is just paying people for reviewing, um, which is nice in that it's modular and uh, easy to test. But I, I'm really curious, like if, looking at these options, uh, what do you guys think about like what is the best way to to incentivize peer review financially? Yeah, and I just see that we're about to to hit time, unfortunately. Uh, but I do uh, really appreciate everyone who has come out to join for the discussion. Uh, and Nick and Umar, if you could just quickly drop the link to the the GitHub uh, issue where we're going to be sharing any of the public updates of this and just generally tracking uh, any of the work that's done there. Uh, please feel free to follow along and comment. We're definitely going to want to have some more public discussions on this. If you want to get involved in any other particular way uh, or just give direct feedback, please feel free to reach out to, to Umar, Nick, or myself. Uh, and yeah, I just really appreciate everyone taking some time and thank you to, uh, to Umar and Nick for presenting today. Thank you all for the amazing discussion. This was incredibly useful. Thanks, everybody. Uh, like I said earlier, this is not the last time we'll be talking about this. Um, so uh, we'll have breakout calls, public discussions, additional presentations. Uh, we'll be surfacing the data, so there's lots more to come. Yeah, thanks, Eugene, for putting this together and inviting everyone. I also dropped a link to the Discord if you all want to continue the discussion there. We have a research channel. Um, you can jump in there and leave comments. Yeah, thanks, yeah, everybody. Thank you for spending part of your Thursday with us. Bye, I can I can stick around if anyone has thoughts that they want to share. Um, yeah, Theodore. Yeah, what what I again, right? Like this is over time, right? So um, something that I I had to learn myself, but I also saw that others had implemented is a mixture of some sort of base compensation that is based on hey, you you did the work, you know, you meant well, and you contributed, and some sort of long term incentive. And I think in terms of research, it's it's it is always an edge case. Like how, how do you, how do you quantify a review at the current state? Because research is about inquiring and inquiring and inquiring and testing and testing and testing. So you don't know if that person that saw the light five years ago was right or not at, you know, five, five years before that. Right. So if there's some sort of system where we say, okay, so there's, if, if somebody has, is accepted in a community and has some base credentials and to review something, they sort of get like a flat fee, you know, like, like you proposed here on the slides, Nick of, um, or oh, sorry, I, I know slides was, but like, say, okay, there's a flat fee covers you basic, you know, you bet your basic costs. And then once you, you, you do a review of something and it's a qualified review as you know, by the standards of the community, it's locked in a system. And I think we're talking about Web3 systems here. So the strength of all of that is if you have one piece of information, like one piece of research or one result or something that's reviewed, it's on chain and the, the, um, the data is, is there forever, right? So we can say whether it turns out to be right in one year or two years or 10 years, this is all on chain. And for me, I think if we have a basic system that says, okay, we'll reward basic participation and then have some sort of bonus in the long term if it turns out in five years that you were right five years ago or in 10 years hey by the way back then with your review you were spot on that you can get a huge bonus and it could incentivize it could incentivize scientists to say hey 
I'll spend my time and I'll get a basic pay. And if I'm right, whether it's one year in the future or five years in the future, I'll get a big bonus for really giving my best. I think that could be an interesting system to really incentivize people to really apply themselves. And at the same time, they know if I'm right here, I can get a bonus in the future if this turns out to be a big deal. Yeah, it's making me think of prediction markets. Um, totally, and in that, totally, yeah, you, you hit that nail straight ahead. So I'm wondering, as part of the peer review process, um, is it the researchers who then rewarded for their research? Like, I think of research tending to not necessarily predict that much, but to show results. Um, so I'm kind of like trying to grapple how they are related. Um, uh, just to jump in, uh, I think also to the, when it comes to like assessing the quality of a paper, there's like, there's, there's assessing like the likelihood of the paper to be true, which is very difficult and changes with time as our beliefs and like what's true changes. And then there's also at, at the moment the paper is published, you know, trying to assess the paper instead for like methods, like how, how, what was the quality of the process that was used? And um, because the likelihood of truth is so hard to answer that we sort of use like the, the quality of the methods, the quality of the process or the logic as like a proxy for a likelihood to be true. Um, and I, I think your question is like, you know, the, the, the age is like time will tell. Can we somehow build this thing into the, um, the incentive mechanism as time will tell, how can we build that in? Because as you rightfully said, it has to go both ways, right? If somebody is right, great, that should be rewarded. But if somebody's completely off and you look at it and you go like, hey, sorry, that's bunk, but it's not proven yet. Down the road, if it's proven that you were completely right to say, hey, this is nonsense, this is not going to work, to also reward that in, in the sense of time will tell. Yeah, I really liked Christopher's idea of having essentially a DAO be in charge of like a domain. So maybe there's a DAO dedicated to governance research, and this DAO is filled with researchers who do governance research. And as they do peer review, this DAO is getting the funding. Um, so when the DAO actually distributes their funds to its members, I, they will definitely have some mechanism to do this, whether it's voting or one way I could see would be reputation based. So if you've done well in the past, now your like monthly payout gets higher. Um, so I could see that reputation score for a person, a peer reviewer in this DAO being associated with their predictions of, oh, this research is definitely not gonna lead to anything useful or the opposite, this research is gonna be groundbreaking. Um, so yeah, just collecting that data, I think would be the essential step. Um, and then actually using that as some type of reputation score, which is correlated to the payout you get um, so yeah, that's just kind of one thought of how that prediction could be incorporated into the payouts for researchers. Uh, time will tell is really interesting. And also, I wonder how we would implement it in our experiment, just because um, it feels like time, time will tell would take time. And we... Uh, are sort of like you know just running like a small experiment and um i think it's definitely possible to start keeping track of the um what that looks like to be determined mm -hmm. so i think for each paper it would be different um because i imagine some papers would allude to like oh um like the next steps for this research are we could eventually have better governance models <laughs> um, if we followed on this path and like develop a certain tool. 
and then that is definitely like geared towards more prediction of what time will tell in the future. Um, I'm not I wonder, convinced that's going to be the case for all research. I, I wonder if we could scrape data from like past papers and reviews and see how they like held up. Like I know there, there are some journals that leave their or that publish their reviews and we could like look at those reviews and those papers and see like how has the consensus on that paper shifted over time. And would that review um, be something we uh, reward more now because with 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 the benefit of hindsight, it's more clear that that review was right about uh, its criticism of the paper. Um, maybe I can quickly jump in here. So when we look at what's happening in crypto, right so you have sometimes you have these protocols that launch with a specific goal and they give you opportunities to do something to support them right for example provide liquidity or hold their token or stake their token right and then once they make it they turn around and they say well guess what everybody who supported us in the past they get an airdrop and that's possible simply because it's all on chain and I know this is incredibly difficult, but if there is some way to put the scientific, the, the, the scientific progress on chain, to say, okay, so 10 years ago, we thought Washington. You just went on mute. Oh, sorry. So, so basically um, there's some, some basic, basic things that are, are under discussion. And if we can keep certain scientific discoveries and discussions on chain then we can track them and so at some point and let's be realistic right at some point many scientific discoveries are um they can be monetized and if there is an on-chain track record of the earliest discoveries and people saying yes this is it and others saying no that's not the case if we can find a way to it in one hand um encourage uh, in investment into the further research of that and on the other hand tie that also to the success that will, it will eventually have the financial success and we keep that all like it, it, as a track record as as a good scientific practice we could find better ways to say hey well you support this early on you said early on you put time into this you read all the theories you verified the paper you said hey this is it and you were super early and then at the stage where it gets monetized, the whole system is set up in a way that cannot be changed that says, hey, everybody who verified this early on, who said, yes, they are right, that's the way forward and that's going to work, that they get rewarded. And at the same time, maybe taking into account a reputational system, those that said, oh, no, this will never work, this is no good, this is punk, they get some sort of penalty. Maybe we can create a system where because everything is kind of on chain and it's all tracked we can figure out rec retrospectively of what was the actual contribution at that point but at the same time and this is very important we give some sort of base salary so if if you're a somewhat respected scientist whether you say yes this is great or you know this is bunk you do get some base payment and then further in the future if it turns out to be right or wrong, you get a, a perspective bonus. So this way you ensure that each scientist who is again verified at some sort of level that engages with it, gets some sort of base pay, is rewarded for their basics, but in the future they're rewarded for their actual insights from the past. Again, it's not easy, but I think this is something that we should aspire to. I think that could be really interesting as a as a two-layer model of incentive where you have like your financial incentive and then you have your reputational incentive and i say that because the idea of like um you you said something was bunk but it turned out to be right and then later on you get punished for it punishing someone financially i you know i'm not sure where i don't think I, i'm not sure i like financially punishment but reputationally punishing someone is very easy because you know you just like dock their reddit karma or something or something like that 
um, and and the reputation also perhaps is like the best uh, vehicle for that incentive because it will go up as somebody's opinions and reviews are better and in the open and and better in the open and also uh, go down as their their reviews get worse or, or are more likely to be wrong um, and 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 then coupling that with with a, a bonus for being right when it was unpopular or being right when many others said it was wrong uh financially I, I see could be really powerful because i like the idea of financial bonuses retroactively even if i don't like financial punishments retroactively um but what do you what do you think about that sort of two-tiered system where you have like your financial um uh, incentive and then you have your sort of reputational score and incentives that change with that um, maybe one quick introduction here and this is something I had to learn. I had to learn it from others because it wasn't natural to me. So there is this concept called whale done. You can Google the book. And the concept is about, so so again, doing a little bit of like a, a, a round here. So I'm, I met this guy at a conference and they were programming stuff on the blockchain. And I asked, I told them, hey, we're creating a company. And they were like, why do you even create a company? And I'm like, well, how do you, how else do you run things? And they were like, well, we have this incentive system where if you do the basics and you show up, you get a base pay. And then we have rewards, bounties for, for doing things. And I was like, well, that sounds great. But what if somebody does something and two months or six months down the road, it turns out you did the wrong thing and he, he, you know, he caused some issues there. And, and this person said to me, well, we don't care about the negative stuff. We just sort of encourage the positive stuff. And he told me about the concept of, it's called whale done, like whale, like, a, you know, the fish, not the fish, like the mammal, but whale done, right? And it was about training killer whales to perform tricks. And the premise was, well, so if you don't feed the whale, they're just going to eat you because they're bigger than you. If you hurt the whale, guess what? They're just gonna, you know, hurt you back, and they're bigger than you, so you can't do anything. If you want to make them jump through a hoop, you got to figure out a way to positively incentivize them and not punish them, because that's the only way to get them to do what what they want to do. So the idea is to create a system where you encourage positive behavior as much as possible, and you, you kind of try to push the the negative behavior away. So I think it's not more about uh, punishing people negatively if they're wrong, but just more about making sure all the positive things that you want to happen, happen, and you incentivize them. Because in the end of the day, overall, that's the way to steer things in the right direction. Uh, this raises a really important question of what is the difference between a scientist and a killer whale? <laughs> um, and uh, it, it sounds like maybe there isn't that much of a difference that we that we have to treat scientists a lot like uh, trainers treat killer whales in order to create a whale done system um, for incentivizing science. Uh, that's really interesting. I got to look that book up. It's also uh, hilarious. Uh, so thank you for sharing. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Bianca, were you going to say something? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, um, regarding the, the peer review and while well, I was following the, the whole discussion, and I kind of had the impression that we are talking about different levels of review, at least from my experience in academia. Like, uh, we don't really judge a uh, paper in terms of its theory. Its theory. So um, the idea that, you know, like a reviewer can say that the you know like a science is right or not in a specific context of study um it's not like something i've ever encountered before like this is actually one of the behaviors that is supposed to be discouraged because um if a reviewer comes from a different you know like lab and has a diff works on a different theory uh, than an author then it could be that they try you know just to you know gatekeep the paper from uh, being published just because they don't agree with the theory. So I guess the focus should be more on the methods and the coherence between 
hypothesis and you know the whole uh, methodological aspects of the study and the results not on the theory in, in, intended as a scientific paradigm uh, as Cohn would say right because there is no way we can actually prove a theory and science works uh, through falsification so we we are not actually interested in confirming things but just in trying to find ways to make um to show that a certain study is robust because we are not able to falsify it like to basically to reject the null hypothesis right mm -hmm. so what well, we have to reject the null hypothesis we are not able to and yeah so basically this is one point in which i would say um like the focus of the impact of the peer review shouldn't be you know like too much attached to the theory of the paper that has been reviewed also because uh this would encourage a behavior in which if i belong to a scientific uh let's say community or like lab that is working on this specific theory uh, i would be incentivized to review this paper because if it gets you know if this theory is let's say not this confirmed in the future then i might have a huge financial or reputational benefit while my job would be just to you know uh, judge the science regardless of the let's say the team and and the other point is that uh, what we are talking about related to reputational uh, incentives and royalty system it kind of already exists in science called the impact factor but the problem mm -hmm. is that the impact factor is not dynamic it's static so you just need to have one big publication and not even and the publication doesn't even need to be yours in the first place like if you are one of the minor authors in a high impact paper you will get all this you will benefit in the future from all this uh, impact factor uh, of the journal so it's also the journal's prestige but also the number of citation of the paper so i think the point uh, there have been some proposal for example to have a fractional impact factor that actually uh rewards people based on their actual contributions um on the paper so often you have a first author that is actually doing most of the of the science and of the paper and other minor authors who are not like you know they, maybe they did some part of the coding or some part of the experiments the analysis or they just uh helped uh, writing the paper but they will all still get the same impact uh as the first author and and regarding the financial and reputation this is something that well i don't totally agree with the, the comment that was i mean i i like this idea of the altruistic model but in my experience um i think it's it's difficult to have you know like um let's say famous researchers or like senior researchers that are gonna do peer review just to make this uh value flow into public goods especially full professors they're very busy and often if they're famous scientists they act mostly as managers of the research the research lab laboratories rather than actual they don't do the science uh, firsthand and basically what could happen what, what happens actually is that many times it's the graduate students or the postdocs who goes to review papers uh signing with their names so i'm not sure if actually in this uh game theoretic model the altruism would work uh like in the proper way and yeah that's it and regarding financial and reputation yeah that's the thing that actually i was proposing with interview to have like a dual token that is reputational and also has some sort of economic value and in a way it's something that is, it has already been done by source grid. uh they managed to to create this model i i don't think it's on chain i think they did it on web 2 platforms like github discord and discourse 
and basically they they developed an algorithm that is inspired by the page rank algorithm of google and they managed to basically determine the contributions in in a discussion uh, in a forum for example and rank these contributions retrospectively and retrospectively reward the people and as I, I don't know if it's Theodore who was suggesting that, or maybe it's Umar, Umar actually. Um, it's really nice because what they do is that when you have this retrospective reward, if you misbehave at some point, you don't get punished financially, but your reputation can go down in the in their system. So it's actually just the reputation token that, uh, let's say it's dynamic, but the, the actual financial let's say token doesn't change so what you have gained the past stays there and this is something that has been used for example for the gitcoin uh, airdrop in 2021 uh, we all well we who got this uh, retrospective uh, airdrop by participating in communities like kernel or gitcoin uh, well the our contributions were um, estimated through the source cred algorithm That's super interesting. Uh, I have to learn more about source cred. I'm putting that on my list. I know that's something uh, we're in the process of implementing at SCURF, where we're standing up our source cred instance to reward contributions on Discourse and Discord and, and maybe also GitHub. Um, I think that's fascinating that they have that two-tiered financial reputation system. Um, I wonder how we could leverage that for some of the experiments we're doing, especially because our um, reviews should be getting posted on the discourse forum. Um, and maybe we could create like a like a bubble within the source cred specifically for peer reviewers. Um, although I don't know that the source cred algorithm would be able to determine the quality of the reviews. It would, I guess just be um, doing that page ranking based on references. Um, I, th I think there's always two aspects to it, right? So one aspect is, did you do it by the book? And the second aspect is, were you right? As in time will tell. And I think in any sort of system, and let's be realistic, right? We're all humans. This is all about humans interacting some way, whether it's all in a lab together or whether it's decentralized around the world on Discord or whatever, right? So I think there has to be some sort of established standard that says, yes, what you're doing here has to be rewarded because you did it by the book, as in you looked at the results, you did the maths or whatever, and you evaluated it and you've done the work and you've you've delivered some some sort of judgment and the other question is then well in the future again who knows but in the future five years ten years or one year was that correct what you did and i think the, the best way to to move forward is because again we're like we're trying to replace traditional systems right so we have to see what are those traditional systems doing right and what are they what are they doing wrong and they've worked so far. I mean, you know, we've, we've created some pretty smart, amazing communities, you know, to get things done. And I think the best way to do this is to, to figure all of these things out and, and test them one by one. As in, how, how can we test that somebody is doing it by the books and they're legit and they're sincere in their intentions? One part. And the second part is, well, how did that play out in the future? Were they actually right or not? And I think, um, I think, Nick, you mentioned the prediction markets. That's exactly where it's at, where you do, if you mix a base effort, kind of like a, you know, UBI, universal basic income. So you're a scientist, you respect it, you do it by the books, you're not a crook, you're evaluating, you're evaluating something. Phase A and phase B is, well, okay, so you, you did all that. Now let's see how that plays out in one year, two years, five years or 10 years. Because for me, I think the best way is to create a system where people just can act naturally, right? So invest without being afraid to lose, 
And at the same time, if you're actually right, if you really get into this, you have a big chance they can benefit from this big time in the future. And, um, and one of the co-founders of VitaDAO and what VitaDAO, I mean, you know, no advertisement here, but what VitaDAO specializes on is trying to find research that is in, I don't know, it's called the value of death, where like there's a, pro, there's a premise there that needs money to be researched. And if the money that's put in there to get this research going can create something that potentially can be something that once leveraged and packaged properly can create huge gains and huge advancement in the re in the respective research field. And I think what we need to cover with all these decentralized decentralized tools that we have to to like currently and that we develop in the future is exactly that verify authenticity measure true intent and then that's one level and the second level is well were you actually right or not and then reward that yeah yeah i think that's super interesting um bianca mentioned that it seems like there's almost two separate types of peer review going on or well like that predicting if this is true or not is not necessarily the role of peer review. It's to um, kind of determine if the methods were sound. And Eric also got, or sorry, not Eric, um, Christopher during the call mentioned two different types of peer review, feedback oriented peer review, which is just with the goal of like looking at the methodology, make sure it's sound and making sure that the paper gets better over time. Um, and then the other way he differentiated peer review is curation oriented peer review. And he defined that as a way, as a method of determining where in his hierarchy of knowledge, this new research fits. So I'm thinking that this like prediction and I haven't had like a clear understanding of these two types of peer review yet. So as Theodore, you're talking about these prediction markets, um, and kind of predicting if this theory is true and will be true in the future makes me think that it might be related more towards a curation oriented peer review where we're looking at how does this knowledge fit into the like society's landscape of this research field. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering if like the two if this is like a fair way to distinguish the types of peer review, feedback and curation, or if there's a better word rather than curation, or if predicting the theory of a paper being correct is its own field of peer review. Um, yeah, curious if that sparks anyone's thoughts. Yeah, kind of my thoughts. Go ahead. No, I wouldn't say I agree with uh, Christopher um, or Christoph uh, before because um, I don't think there are two types of peer reviews in this sense. Like nowadays, uh, that that's what reviewers write in their you know review, uh, like all together. So they judge. They're asked to judge the novelty of the paper of the study, but also all the methodological aspects. Um, I guess he wanted to uh, separate the two, saying that the two aspects are orthogonal in the sense that one thing is the impact, another thing is the soundness of the of the study. And I totally agree. And there are actually journals who don't uh, who actually will explicitly ask uh, reviewers to not judge the impact, um, the novelty aspect. And for example, in my own experience, when I submitted papers, um, I didn't have uh, reviewers uh, like mentioning this uh, regarding my my paper. So, which it's something that it seems more like a, the editor's job, right? And regarding judging the theory, um, I was saying actually that uh, it's something that I, I've never encountered and I, I don't even know if it's something that is requested. Actually, I think it's discouraged in the sense that you could have uh, people like authors and reviewers who, who come from different theories uh, and they are still in the same field. 
of studies. And, and if you encourage uh, this kind of behavior, um, I would be afraid that actually there might be some game theoretical mechanism in which you try to, you know, like block a specific paper from being published because it's not within your, I don't know, your paradigm. So, yeah. Yeah. That, so that's making me think, I was thinking of trying to think of an example of like where there's different theories and people are still publishing papers because I come from computer science where it's very like matter of fact, it's not really theoretical, it's just result-based. Um, but in psychology, like there's theories of consciousness and there's an attention schema theory of consciousness which says one thing about how the brain works to develop consciousness. And there's another like the global workspace theory of consciousness. Um, so in this sense, it's like in Theodore's model of like prediction and seeing whose theory will win in the end, um, that does seem like another uh, level of review compared to curation because in the curation model, it's like these two theories of consciousness are equally valid. They come from some data points. They're inferring new information, but they both exist at a point in time right now and neither of them are proven. Um, so that's like curating that into its own knowledge graph essentially but then actually predicting if one of these will be proven to be true is it's another field. Um, and yeah, I'm wondering if that's important to include in the peer review process, like predicting if this theory will be true or not. I definitely think it is helpful for um, acknowledging which researchers are essentially like good researchers, because <laughs> if they're able to predict what theories were gonna be true in the future, um, they're probably pretty intelligent and might have a better shot at predicting what theories would be true in the future that have not been proven yet. Um, but yeah, the peer review process seems more geared towards seeing if a current paper is solid. <laughs> um, and I think with, when you get into the predictions, it'd just be saying um, people who have predicted well in the past are now predicting that this paper is going to be good um, and that would give some indication that this paper that's being peer-reviewed is a high quality paper um on maybe sorry go ahead uh, i was just two quick comments uh one on the topic of uh opposing theories of reviewers being competition to promote gatekeeping uh, I think that's super interesting, and I'm hoping, or at least one of the things I, th I think we're hoping to do with, with with open peer review is, if you if your identity as a reviewer is going to be disclosed, if it's not going to be anonymous, then hopefully you should be encouraged to not gatekeep, to not be someone who's stopping someone else's theory just because it opposes yours, because if you do that, you, you'll be doing it in public, and people will be able to say, hey, look at that guy. He was just saying no to him because it's uh, against his own theory. Um, so so I, I'd be interested to know what you guys think about the effect of openness of like public reviews. Um, and then the second thing is, as, as we dive deeper into this conversation of like, um, what is the role of review in terms of like telling the truthfulness or telling the, the quality of the methods? Um, it would be great to get your guys' thoughts if you have a few more minutes here um, on some of the specific questions we have for reviewers to answer. Um, these were some of the slides that we didn't get to share today, but maybe we could uh, run through really quickly, just like put up on the screen and say like, is this a good question to ask a reviewer or is it not? Um. I think that's that's a really cool take, uh, Umar. Um, but by the way, let's find a way to get in touch after this call, um, so we so we can keep this going. Um, by the Definitely. way, um, me and another uh, Alex, another co-founder of VitaDAO, we started the DSI Alliance in order to kind of see how we can kind of bring these things together. But anyways, what I wanted to say is that I think what's really important. And, you know, I think everyone here is mature enough to understand that we have different forces at play and each force that's at play is a different tool. And at the end of the day, we're dealing with human beings. So using different tools will get us different results. 
And I think what we need to think about hard is so we have the scientific process, which means evaluating best practices, peer review, doing things great. And on the other hand, and, and again, that, that is merit in and of itself. So if you evaluate a really shitty research and you do it completely well and right, that has merit in and of itself, even though the research might not turn out to be anything valuable, but you thoroughly reviewed it. And the other thing is to say, well, let's reward whatever, you know, the worst case makes the most money, right? Whatever research, whatever patent, whatever outcome is the most interesting financially to be monetized later that yields the most results financially, right? And what, what we must not, you know, not discount is basically that um, in the field of science, and I've noticed that, you know, when you're talking to different investors into all the biotech stuff we're doing at ETA now is there's some people that are genuinely concerned with longevity. How can we live longer? What can we do? But at the same time, they have a financial incentive. And I think for me, in order to move science, whatever science it is, into the future, is to see how can we bring together in a meaningful way, on one hand, the, the pursuit of truth and the pursuit of you know, financing and profits. And I think this should kind of be a two-tiered process where on one hand, we reward the correct methods being applied, saying this is good or this is bad. And then in the future, obviously the rewards that come from that. And I, I know this is huge, but with, with blockchain and Web3 systems, we can kind of try to record the, those different steps that are being taken and make sure we can have a full accounting of what happened in order to determine whether something is like a good, good, good idea to pursue or not, or a good theory to pursue or not. And then in the other hand, to see whether that's actually something that can lead to real profit. And I think in terms of science, and luckily many, you know, at least Western societies that are fairly wealthy have managed that process as to say, hey, we'll pay scientists fairly well so they can pay the rent and they can do the research. And if somebody does a spin off to create something specific that is financially very wide, very viable, they can make like super normal profits. And I think the way forward is in a decentralized space, if we can mix exactly that, where we can say, okay, so this is good practice. And we want as many smart people as possible to practice these, you know, um, best practices to evaluate science, to, you know, do the right research. And at the same time we say, okay, so if you've done all that, you get like the normal rewards. But if you're onto something, if you really dig in, and you're saying, hey, that, that thing, that's going to be it, that's going to revolutionize sector X or research X in a cancer or whatever, that you have the chance to actually profit of the extraordinary uh, rewards that come from that. Because if we look at decentralization with Web3, it's like, what are we trying to do? We're essentially trying to wrestle away some of the huge profits that you know Pfizer and you know Wyeth and whatever, like all these big companies are currently getting out of it. And we're trying to solve the dichotomy where you have publicly funded research with taxpayer money investing and investing, paying scientists, you know, uni grants and whatever, creating all the base work, which then sometimes leads to something, and then the big company goes like, okay, wait, we can turn this into commercial product. And it ends up being some sort of highly marketed pharmaceutical where some company benefits like extraordinarily off. And some of those profits are completely siphoned off away from science, away from benefiting people into private hands. And I know, you know, <laughs> I've, I've gone quite far here, but I think essentially that is what's at stake when we look at these systems and incentives and we think about what should go to scientists, what should go to community and what should go to those that fund all these things. And can we like in the process of decentralization, which is what the web three is about decentralization is how can we go about 
all these different components and create a fair world, starting with what's the right science to evaluate up until to the point where we say, okay, how does the commercialization of that look? Money as a vehicle for where society allocates value has traditionally been used not in the pursuit of truth and aligning it so that society allocates value to where truth is being found um, is the biggest potential gain of DSI or of a financial system built on blockchain that prioritizes science. Um, instead of putting value on Gucci bags and Louis Vuitton and, and this, that, and the other thing, if instead we put value on um, who is finding the most research, not just at like the individual level, but really at the society level, where would we be in 100 years or 200 years or 300 years? Uh, and also, um, that's, yeah, that, that jives heavy with me for like, what DSI should do. Um, and yet also is like the hardest challenge is like culture. Um, because uh, getting those investors financially interested in finding truth rather than in like making profit um, is uh, about like values that they hold. And I, I'd be curious uh, about like how, how that shift happens. Um, you know, like, if, if people could just be altruistic, maybe that would uh, that would be easy. Um, or I, I know I know Vita Dow's doing some interesting things with like IP NFTs, or maybe maybe you can say you own this um, element of something that that uh, holds some truth value or some information value um, that has been assigned. A, a value by society that's increased over time. Um, that's that, that, that's a really interesting potential future. Um, I, that's just a really put in here, right? Like I'm I'm one of the co-founders of Vita now, but I don't necessarily agree with everything. Mm -hmm. And I've also had quite a bit of experience in a traditional, <laughs> like in the, in the other Web three space, like DeFi, and I think it's super important that while doing all of these pursuits, we think about are we like like what kind of incentive structures are we creating, and are we simply replacing an old um, oligarchy system. that just isn't clued in with a new oligarchy that is clued in? You know. Yeah. Uh... I think about that sometimes around like the realms of like open science versus private um, assets and how that interaction or those incentives are almost at odds because because open science is very much about this like collaborative, like let's all share, let's all work together to find the truth and um, privatizing it is really good for financializing it. Um, and yet is also to the detriment of the open science collaborative movement that needs information to be shared in public. Um, but you know, greedy people will work their ass off and will work 24 seven if they feel that they'll get more money by doing that. So on one hand you can say, okay, so there's like, financially incentivized people trying to co-opt science but on the other hand if you turn it around you could say well there's science can we co-opt financially incentivized people that will work day and night to make things happen get deals done set up systems create platforms because they're greedy and want to make more money i mean put it putting it bluntly Yeah, that's fascinating. Because um, because one thing I realized is that there's there's a lot of people they have a lot of money, whether it's crypto or traditional money. And I have to say, so they're they're nice people. 
they have interests and they say, hey, look, I'm if, if I feel you're right, I'll give you a lot of money. But obviously, they're counting on, hey, wait a second. So if, you know, like one of those five ventures I invest in gets really big, I'm going to get like 50 times the reward that I'm putting into it, right? So and, and this is something I personally experienced a lot the mix between financial incentives of things to go well versus the creative spirit of the inventors to things to go well. And I sometimes feel it needs both. So saying, oh, it's going to be all altruistic. It's like, great. Okay. You're stuck with the hippies <laughs> and saying, oh, it's all going to be financial. You're going to be stuck with those multi-level marketing people that just are ruthless and they don't care if it all collapses once they cash out. Right. So I think we're going to find a way in between between scientific truth in the current moment, scientific um, accuracy in the long term, as in time will tell, and well, how do we get the money in there that is on one hand just you know creating a cash flow that allows for creative uh, thought without financial pressure to deliver tomorrow or create some cash flow and say, hey, it's fine do those research for five years. I believe in this. If it doesn't work out, I have four other ventures. And um, yeah. Find, finding the sweet spot where it's balanced um, between financial incentives and collaborative open science. Um, yes, I would love to share those slides with the questions for peer reviewers and also catch up more. If you could share your... Thank you, Telegram. I think we might be connected. Uh, and Theodore, if you could also share your contact information, I'd love to continue the conversation um, another day. And I'll also uh, throw out there that at SCURF, you know, we really do want this to be an open collaborative process and we're looking for more people to get involved uh, with what we're doing here. So if that interests either of you, uh, you know, not just coming to these community calls, but maybe some more like breakout sessions, uh, we'd love to have you there. And thank yeah, you, and thank we're, you for we're your currently thoughts. Yeah, th thanks a lot for organizing this, uh, Umar, and uh, thanks, Bianca, for, for putting in those great thoughts here. So we're currently, one of the things we're working on is like the DSI Alliance. Uh, you can look it up on Twitter. And our main thought is, and again, this, this is coming from me and my co-founder, Alex, of, of founding VitaDAO, is that <laughs> there's a lot of lessons to be learned, and we're just at the beginning. So the idea for the for the DSI Alliance is to say, hey, how can we communicate to wider audience the challenges we're facing and get people in to talk about that, to share knowledge, to share resources, to see where we're going? Because we're so incredibly early that whatever input you get might be competitive advantage, but you're so early that it's benefiting everyone. Right. So mm, maybe in like a week or two, we can have a little interview and you can share with us like what the vision, like from your specific, um, what do you call it? Sorry, English is not my first language, but like your specific niche knowledge that you're providing at, uh, at SCURF, what is your experience and what is your vision? Because we're just trying to share that with others to get some feedback. So maybe you're interested in doing a little interview. Just saying, hey, this is what we will like, you know, five to 10 minutes. Hey, this is what we think. This is what our vision is. And this is how we encourage people to take part of it and share in it. And we can push that out and see just what comes back, right? Because uh, we're all, we're all, we're all beginners at this, you know, to see what happens. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that sounds awesome. Uh, very interested in learning from your experience and that of others and starting, uh, Vita Dao and, and anything in DSI. I I think like one of my favorite parts of DSI is that it, you know, it, it it's such a community where we're all sort of learning together uh, in these early days. And uh, I'm happy to share my perspective. I'm also happy to um, ask Eugene to to share more of, of Scurf's perspective or or maybe Rich. Um, yeah, just we, because we had I'm... a call with Eugene before. Awesome. He, like he okay. invited us here. Perfect. Um, then, yeah, happy happy to share my perspective. Um, I'm I'm still kind of new at Scurf, so I don't want to like speak for uh, the entire forum. 
Um, but I'd be, yeah, I'd love to have a conversation around that and like where d could go. Uh, so yeah, uh, can I reach out to you on Telegram, Theo Wall? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, just, just be aware. Wait a second. Let me, let me put you in a folder. Otherwise, I get like, I get contacted a lot on Telegram with a lot of spam. Hmm. Wait a second. Okay. Look, I pinged you. Awesome. Is, that, is that you? This is the right Umar Khan. Uh, let me check right now. Umar Khan. Yeah, hey. that's it. Okay. Yep. Will not ask for ETH. Thank you for not asking for ETH. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. Like, if I ever ask you for ETH, that's on me. I had like so many scammers because like I work for, like I work with different projects that I founded, and yeah, it's just a lot of scams. So yeah, if I ask you for ETH or BNB, that's on me. You can you can ask <laughs> me for Doge. You can ask me for Doge. <laughs> yeah, 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 all right. Uh, like honestly, I mean, it's it's just us in the call right now, right? But so like for me the. The essence of this is so I think the D the D size space is gonna explode in the next six months to three years. Mm. But I feel there's a lot of on one hand a lot of enthusiasm, which is awesome, but also a lot of naivete mm -hmm. about what can actually be valuable and and um like what can actually work. And to me, one of the biggest challenges in the space is bringing together different people and balancing the like the long-term incentives with the short-term incentives in keeping out the bullshit because if it's one thing i learned from from DeFi is that once something goes well you have a huge lineup of scammers wannabes people thinking oh it's going to be easy it's going to be great right so like kind of separating the um the good stuff from the bad stuff that that will be hugely essential in the next you know one or two years to to see like what something with a really like with an actual perspective that's going to go somewhere and something that's just somebody saying i have this great vision here's my token buy the token we'll advertise it and then people just following in and buying the token um because yeah. What I've noticed before in the in the blockchain space is that there is huge, huge amounts of money around. And there's a lot of people there that basically they don't care. They just want to get rich. And there's a huge amount of people as well, proportionally, that say, hey, the space is crazy. It's fun. But if you show me something that's actually a long-term investment that isn't bullshit, but for real, I'm very happy to engage with it and put money into it. And I think in, in DSI, that hasn't happened yet. And I hope that next one or two years we can get there because as with any project out there that has a token, you get some sort of like, once it, once it's sort of trending, you get like everyone and their mother go like oh, it's the future let's buy in and hope like you know it's the next bitcoin or whatever but at the same time there's many many people that in the last couple of years made a lot of money with crypto and are saying hey i'm done you know i can retire if i want i can retire if i want to but i don't want to retire yet i want to do something cool now with the rest of my money and i think those are the kind of people that if we can formulate our message right we can engage them, get them to invest and get them to spread the word around other circles of very serious investors that say, hey, crypto is cool. I love investing with crypto, but I even more, I love investing into something that I think is meaningful in the industry and even for humanity in terms of go, like in terms of getting ahead. Because if somebody has been in crypto for a couple of years, I can tell you one thing, they're sick of the bullshit. They're really sick of it. And if you have an authentic vision, you know, you have like, you know, a, a special, like a unique, like a USP, unique selling proposition, right? Yeah, I, I, I haven't been in crypto that long. I've been in it for maybe six months and I've already seen so many, 
so many people starting projects with like very loose ideas. And I started my own project and did not realize how loose my idea was until I went through the process and understood like there, there is a, a whole universe of things to understand in order to build something that people want and that works, uh, that solves a problem. And I feel like Desai, you hit the, yeah, like, it's still so early. There's 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 a whole community that's energized and it is is amazing. And there's also a need for it to coalesce around like a specific vision that it's trying to enact. Right now, it kind of feels like we have a lot of different competing visions in the space, most of which are sort yeah. of not like, you know, not not like that far out. Like most of them are like trying to build something right now but not necessarily like super playing into like what is what does this look like in like five years or ten years or um things like that and and finding like a real pathway that creates a, a decentralized science ecosystem that's well defined in terms of its primary goal being the pursuit of truth the pursuit of like scientific information and yet uses leverages cryptocurrency crypto economic systems financial incentives um to be a better process than the one we have today a lot of it feels like a return to just the original promise of the internet uh to be honest like a lot of like what decentralized science means feels right now to me like just going yeah. back to what we could do with science if we have the internet but but did not occur perhaps because there were not enough financial incentives there was not enough reason for people to be to do it on the internet in a in an open collaborative way and i think what we have now is a direct connection like literally i mean you know looking at what vita now is doing with the with the um, ip nft you can literally go from having a stake in an in an nft that is holding intellectual property all the way back to the person saying, yes, I'll buy in, I'll hold a token that is connected to all of that. Right. So I think we, we, we have more tools to decentralize ownership. But I think what's important to know is that 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 doesn't that does not solve any, any of the human issues that we have, whether that's laziness, stupidity, manipulation, you know, like all these things you have in a scientific process that leads to bad papers, bad peer reviews, or like people cheating and getting people to review papers that are basically bunk and all these kind of things, right? So it's not getting rid of that. So, so this is sometimes where I'm a bit cautious about DSI is once people are like, oh yeah, it's gonna be amazing, it's like, Yes, it could be amazing, but it's going to be a lot of work and you're going to have to work through a lot of issues that have nothing to do with technology, nothing that blockchain or the Web3 can solve, but that is about how can we organize humans, human thought, human interest and human uh, judgment of, you know, again, of, of scientific methods or scientific rigor. To, to make sure we, we kind of go in the right direction. And to me, honestly, it might seem a bit morbid, but that's my fascination with DSI is that there's all these people that are discovering the Web3 and they go like, oh, this could be amazing. To go like, yeah, yeah, it could be. Now let me see how you're actually going to address all these human issues that have been there for I, I mean, I don't know since when have people complained about like Elsevier and like their publication processes, you know, it's like, it, it, to me, almost like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's almost every person I talk to that has gotten into it, no matter what scientific field they're from, they're like, oh, yeah, the publication process is totally broken. It's like, yeah, I realize that. But like, you know, <laughs> how do you think we can actually unbreak that and create a better system with all the people involved? And it's super hard to do. And I love that people are actually willing to do this. But I'm currently, for example, 
regarding the DSI, right? Uh, like we're seeing that there are several projects trying to tackle this. There will be a huge competition and um, it, it's not going to be easy. Like this will be like, if somebody actually comes in and tries to judge the effort of all of this, that's where the rubber meets the road and it's not going to be easy. And there is huge, potentially huge rewards reaped by those that get it right. But it's not going to be presented on a silver platter. Like it's, this is very serious. And the intention or the feeling of, hey, we need to fix this or that system. Yes, completely agree. But that will involve a lot more than a few review, a, cha a few changes in the review process or reward systems. Because um, I've been in the Web3 space for a couple of years. And one thing that interested me, like or fascinated me a lot is that over those years, I've seen academia, like, you know, people with a PhD becoming interested in the space. And what um, is your background, by the way? before web3 um, i'm a sociologist and i've been working in marketing ever since but i hate promotions so my like what i want to market is always things that are of a technical more sophisticated nature that i can wrap my head around and tell the story of why this is a good product or a good technology to those that need to make the decision whether to use that. And at some point I crossed over into crypto. I mean, or I don't want to say crypto, but like blockchain and web three. And it's been the same ever since that I work with people that create amazing te technology and I help them explain it and push it to a wider audience and, you know, kind of keep like a no nonsense approach. So I guess, yeah, that, that, that was how it up. And we, like, you know, I run and, a couple of crypto projects that, you know, are worth like TVL, like total value lock. It's like a couple hundred, like a couple hundred million. So they're not, they're not shit tokens. Right. So, yeah. I've, I've never heard of Vita Dow. What is that? Um, uh, or any, yeah. It's, it's look, look like, put it simply, it's kind of under, like, here's the thing. <laughs> so Vita Dow is a bit special because it's under the radar. So we have not engaged with the traditional crypto uh, investor crowd. Mm. So Vida Dao is essentially, you could call it a community investment DAO that invests into early stage projects that promise to have some sort of research going that will advance the field of human longevity. So whether that's, you know, rapomycin, whether that's like brain oriented or whether it's body oriented, anything that helps a human being to live a longer, healthier life, Vita Dao is interested in funding that research as early as possible and doing so by saying, hey, we'll take the intellectual property that will come out of this and turn it with the help of Molecule, which is a company that specialized on this, into an IP NFT. So with the help of lawyers, the IP, the intellectual IP coming from the research of the project will be turned into an NFT that can even be fractured. So this way it allows for the crypto world to purchase the ownership, to finance the research and in the end also to diversify it and spread it out to as many as people as possible by fractionalizing that NFT. And the idea is to do so at an early stage. So to identify projects, again, what, whatever they have to do with longevity, whether it's like something small or whether it's what, one second, somebody knocked at the door, like one second. Sorry, real life falling. Uh, just, just quickly. So uh, to to fund that, and the idea was to um, 
at the same time create a governance where we say, okay, we pool all these resources and we create a voting system and an evaluation system where, so VitaDAO has a deal flow working group where projects that we find or projects that come to us say, hey, we have this cool idea, a research idea that needs to get funded about mice living longer, mice not getting Alzheimer's or whatever kind of trial that needs money. That is kind of like early stage. We fund it, we make a deal with them to say, hey, so the, the research you're creating the researchers get some tokens in that, like some stake. Vita now gets some stake in it. They fund it with money, and then they work on the process to make sure that it, the early research is funded and is also something that is worthwhile doing. And then it gets commercialized later on, and the scientists who did the early research benefit but at the same time, obviously, all the investors that said, hey, we believe in you, this is a good place to go, also benefit from it. And to do so outside of the traditional framework of the old school patent system, but a more open system of um, fractionized NFTs. So some people can say, okay, we believe in this really early on, we'll invest in it, the IP gets turned into an NFT and this NFT can get fractionalized. So hundreds or thousands of people can actually buy into it in the long term and say, hey, I believe in the research. I think this is going to pay off and actually buy in. Can I ask, um, is there a percentage or a fraction of the NFT you have to own in order to um, I guess like create something that lets you profit off of the nft like if it, it, it let, let's like make up an example of it being the ip for like a drug um i mean profit again profit is is fractionalized the same way so you earn one percent you you get one percent of the profit right you earn 10 you like you own 10 percent, you get 10 percent of the profit right and that's built into the system um regarding the terms for the individual scientists and the individual research project that is done by the longevity research group and the working group to work out what is the risk so what do we offer the scientists and what do we offer to vita now in terms of profit sharing in the long term and that's something that's we worked up by experts in the field Right. So if there's some sort of like, you know, DNA research towards longevity, there has to be some sort of evaluation of what is the likelihood of how successful successful it will be and what's the likelihood of that turning a potential commercial um, profit. And based on the whole mix there, there's an individual contract being created with each project, just like a regular VC would do, right? To see what risk am I taking, what are the rewards potentially, and what am I giving and what am I getting? Right. So that's a super interesting example of like trying to take the science and co-opt the financial people. Um, and I'm really interested in seeing what um, other mechanisms like that are created in the coming six months to three years as DCI blows up. Um, it's really cool. Right. Also, also man, listen, I'm, I'm going to, it's, it's evening here. I'm going to have to, you know, get dinner for with sure. my family. So let's, let's stay in touch. That was super interesting. I would also be interesting from the DCI Alliance to have like an interview yeah. with you or somebody from your team to talk a little bit more about what is your vision and also what is your opinion? We're super early in this space. Like, what is your aspiration? How do you feel about the space? And where do you think you can take it? And the other thing is, if you have any questions around, you know, funding or IP NFTs, we can hook you up with VitaDAO or Molecule to give you more information so we can set up a call with different people here, depending what you're interested in, whether it's like tokenomics or vision or whatever. More than happy to share.
Sounds great. Yeah, super interested in having some more conversations. Uh, Theodore, this was awesome. Thank you for staying on for an extra hour. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks a lot more for organizing this. Yeah, Take care. Look, look, gotta go. looking forward to more. See ya. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.